Our, our next speaker needs no introduction. <laughs> Bill Weichel is, uh, among Mullenites, our resident surveyor and engineer and devil's advocate, which is a nice way of, nicer way of saying advocate of the devil. Bill is from Missoula. He's a, a veteran of these conferences. He's helped us put on the three Missoula conferences in 2008, in 2014, and this year's conference. He's our, our fearsome leader, and um, he is going to talk today about something a little bit different than what he has been talking about at past conferences with the surveying equipment. But this is a nice display there uh, of Bill's stuff that he gets out of his museum in his man cave in the basement of his Missoula home. Uh, one of the old ancient Coke cans that Mullen left on the trail back in the old days. Bill Weichel. No, I think I can make it. So I tried, some, I tried something new with my display is because my back's starting to hurt and I know a lot of yours are. I put it up a little higher this year so you can see it without bending over. Uh, so bending over so far. Let me back up here a bit. Okay, there's my... What I'm going to talk about today is a little different from what you've heard me in the past. Usually I talk about the equipment, the methodology, etc. that they used for measuring... Sir, yes sir, who is it? Am I too loud? Okay, um, well, I figured out by watching everybody else that you ha about halfway through your talk, you figure out the exact right spot to where you can get it without getting the feedback or whatever it is where it keeps clunking. We've got wood right there, anybody like that? It's, it's a winner, no, not top of my chin. I don't want it that close. I can listen to it here. Anyhow, so what I'm gonna talk about is how the Mullen Road has moved since the beginning of uh, the initial construction. Um, just as a refresher, uh, the original location construction took place, whoop, took place spring of 1859 through the summer of 1860. Started down here at Walla Walla area, went across the eastern plains of Washington, went on along the south side of the Coeur d'Alene Lake, went over through the I don't know what that valley, what's that valley called, Bob? What do they call that valley? Silver, Silver Valley. Went through the Silver Valley, you know, past uh, the Cataldo Mission, over the top of the mountains, down the St. Regis, uh, across the St. Regis, followed the Clark Fork up through Missoula, on up the Clark Fork, over the mountains, or actually over the Mullen Pass, and on over to Fort Benton across the prairie. We're in open country, where little, there was little, God, I got a nervous finger there, apparently. Uh, so in open country, it really didn't take any construction to do anything. We used the policy of the first wagon track wins. They knew kind of where they wanted to go. The first wagon headed toward that, and that was the trail, unless somebody decided that that wasn't the perfect trail. Stream crossings, they had to move earth to get wagons down into the stream and back out the other side. Timber country, like down in Bob's area in Silver Valley, they cut the trees as close as they could to the ground and ideally straddled them, rather than having to troll, pull stumps. Uh, some areas, like the big side cut, was necessary to perform the extensive excavation that we just heard about from Ron. As the road was constructed, located and constructed, they had a crew behind them that followed mapping the alignment using a compass and a wheel revolution counter, aka odometer. Um, I've got, I'll, I'll show you first, but I've got, got a couple with me. Here's the type of compass that they might have used. It's a vein compass. They had an odometer uh, revolution counter uh, uh, for a wagon wheel. Let me see if I can do this without making too much noise. Thank you. 
So I've got that compass right there. I won't hand it around, it's pretty hefty. But that was very typical of that time period. The compass came around like this type of compass was, came around in the 1700s. Um, Gurley and company, or L w and L e Gurley started manufacturing in a factory in the 1850s. Very possible that this is what, uh, what Mullen had. They had a wagon odometer that was typical of what they would have had uh, on almost all military expeditions at that time period and probably had on most uh, wagon trains heading west. They had one in order to see how far they'd gone and where they were, when they were going to hit water holes. If you've seen the traveler, miners and travelers guides, they had one on there or, or they would have had something so that they knew where the stops were so that they didn't stop at one spot and it was a dry camp and the next morning they went a half a mile over the ridge and there was a, uh, an oasis. Uh, this, op this operated by attaching this to the wagon wheel, putting this inside as the wagon wheel went around. This went with it inside this case. A couple of dial wheels around there turned and counted the number of revolutions. It's pretty slick. I've got 15 of these made by different Okay, so they had, conceptually you can see what they're doing here. Okay, this is uh, with Jackson, I think, in, or I'm not, or, or I, what the guy's name in Yellowstone Park, when he was exploring in there, they've got this two-wheeled cart, because a two-wheeled cart's easier to pull through the timber than four because they can go over logs, whereas a four-wheel can't. You can look close here, you'll see that little case right there. That's not the axle, that's not the end of the axle, that's an odometer right there. And they're mapping in Yellowstone Park with that device. Okay, they kept track of the data as they went along. They had, uh, on this you see, they call this a station. So it's, this is number 218, number 219, 220, etc. We got an odometer reading when they pass that station. They've got an odometer reading at the next station. They got an odometer difference, which in this case is 170 Ren revolutions. They've got a table somewhere where they record, they can figure out the number of miles by the number of revolutions. They record a course, which is a degrees right from north. So here they're going north 35 east. This pretty much you can tell where that they're on the Mullen Road running east because all of these are to the right side of north. I thought you were bad, Tom. I'm terrible. <laughs> so they made a lot of types of maps, which is what is some of the data that we use in today's time period in order to try to figure out where they had been at the time. So this particular type of map is just all they're doing is they're plotting the, the generalized center line. We're coming down here from the east, east of Alberton. We're coming down. We, as we go into Nine Mile, they showed two things, two places, one near the bottom, which would be during, maybe during low water, and one during, up, up further up the stream during high water. They come around, they go through Six Mile, they go and come around to Frenchtown, they note Browns out here, which if you go to the Mullen and the Miners and Travelers Guide, he will say that that's a good place for a stop. He has water and supplies. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, Kim. Kim's a real stickler on all this stuff. He's he, and not not because he wants you to hear. He wants the TV guy to hear <laughs> in the back. Okay, I'll try this then, Kim. Okay, we got this one through the Missoula Valley. You can see if if you've seen Missoula long enough, you can kind of see that how when they plotted it through here, that's the way the river generally traveled at that time period. We had the island that used to be in the center of what's now the Bear Tracks Bridge. Um, it went across through what is downtown Missoula now, went around through Hellgate Canyon, jumped up the hill in the East Missoula area, around East Missoula. God dang it. Okay. 
and then heading on out toward uh, Marshall Canyon, Marshall Grade. Okay, as I go along, if somebody's got a real hardcore question that they can't wait and aunt to answer, ask, I'll, I'll respond to something just because it makes me, it kind of cranks me up and I'm not cranked up enough at this point in time. Yes? For you, so that where it goes around East Missoula, is yes. that, that trail you can see up on the side of Jumbo that goes around into the... They, they are right along where the railroad track is right now. It's down at the bottom, yes. And does that say observatory at the mouth of the rattlesnake? They, they, they call, yes, that's at the rattlesnake. They call that an observatory because they set up equipment there to try to determine latitude and longitude in order to get their whole map oriented to the country. Okay, this I'll show you later, but this is what kind of how Front Street appeared, right like that, coming to the original Missoula Mills. Over in, in the Silver Valley, we've got one where they show where they really did a refined map. This one on top is their map, and they are showing, uh, when, when I compare it to a blown up Forest Service map right below it, you can see each one of these lines maps, matches up with the feature on the current map, so they were doing some pretty accurate data. Uh, you know, not precision, but precise enough to where it give the character of the land. Other than right over here, where I think they either dropped a mile or gained a mile in somewhere in their calculation. They did a, uh, what's called the map of the mountain section. Um, I think Bob has a copy laying over there somewhere, a part of that. In that they have very detailed uh, data on a lot of these places that we see talk about now. All of these are primarily in the Missoula area, but there's the point of rocks and the big side cut that we've talked about and that we're going to see on our bus trip tomorrow. Here's Higgins and Wardens, which is the, uh, the original Hellgate. It's Contonement right where they had a camp for constructing uh, the three mile grade and for the bridge across the Blackfoot there. Uh, Medicine Tree Hill, which is where those of you who were with us in 14 or 13, whenever it was, we went out there, looked at that. Uh, we go north of Johnny Grant's at LaBarge City, which is Deer Lodge, and we go over the Mullen Pass. And this stuff is really precise, you know, in a spatial relationship, so it's good, it's good data to work with for understanding where the Mullen Road was. Okay, so now here we are, we're 60 year, 160 years later, and we want to find the Mullen Road, okay? And we all, in general, we want to find the Holy Grail. We want to stand right there where John Mullen walked by, and we want to feel like the last thing that crossed that was a wagon. And, and that, is, I've been at this for 30 years, and that is a tough thing to do. I've had, I would say out of the how many miles, 650? That's not about right, Ken, 650 miles? 694, precision. 624, precise man right there. Okay, so out of that, I maybe have seen two and a half miles in the whole thing that I feel the last thing that really went across that thing was a wagon because of all the changes that have taken place since then. When I first got involved with the Mullen Road uh, years ago with Chuck Mead back, I think it was 94, he took me down by his place through the uh, Point of Rocks and he, told, he showed me this road and he says, this is the Mullen Road. This is what I drove. I went to school on this road from my place. We, we had the little school bus went down this road. And I was, uh, you bet Chuck, that's good stuff. Well, subsequently I have found out that this particular cut was made by the Milwaukee in 1908 when they had conflict with their railroad cutting across the Mullen Road and they needed to reroute it. Same thing with this one. OK, 
Okay, they had to reroute. They couldn't go where the original Mullen Road was. This particular one, it seems, I think years ago, it might all be gone now, but right about here, there was about 31-gallon 30, black powder cans rotted away. So that's what they had used to go through these things was black powder, but Mullen didn't have that much, but the railroad did. Okay, then, you know, as I've gone along, I ran into this, and I never knew about this years ago, and this is something that Kim got us tuned into, was the three-mile grade, which was a rerouting. This isn't, this isn't the original Mullen Road, but this is the next year's original Mullen Road. And so this might have been something that we can feel like, you know, like Mullen had been on, other than, but, but the last thing is in a wagon, because I think uh, Dennis Sane was telling me that somebody, Willie Bateman, I think it was Willie Bateman, remembers going across this one when he was a kid, because he couldn't go down, there wasn't a highway down along the railroad. Okay, but we've seen a few places like this one. Okay, this is, this is one of those places that when you see it, it kind of gives you that little chill. This is on the west side of Medicine Tree Hill. Um, this is Gene Tripp, the property owner. I think that might be the back of my head before I got all these beautiful locks. But we, he pointed this one out to us, and him and Gary Little and Kim and I walked over this hill, and we looked at a lot of stuff that was the, the power, or the couple of power companies been up there, put up high tension lines. They had rotted the heck out of every hill, all over the hill. And I would go along and I'd say, well, that might be it, but you know, just, it might have, they might have overlaid the old one, but not. But then pretty soon we came down through these trees and all of a sudden here was, what, maybe 200 yards, Gary? 200 yards of, of wagon tracks, very definite wagon tracks. And then there's this little piece that back in that uh, Point of Rocks area that I was in uh, back in 94, we were preparing a slide presentation for the Point of Rocks and I was taking pictures and I went out for a, getting pictures to do it and I went out one day and I was trying to take a picture of one of those cuts that I showed to the Milwaukee and I saw a little track going off down through the woods and I followed it and I came to this. And this was a very definite thing to where most of this had been rock thrown out to the side. Maybe they had used a pick and tossed the rock out to the side. And this to me is, the, the, you know, is one of the biggest holy grails because it was used for wagons until the Milwaukee cut it off in 1908. How am I doing, Kim? Am I talking into it? Are you happy? No? Okay. So, so the, to me, the first change in the alignment of the Mellon Military Wagon Road took place when a wagon traveling after the engineering surveying crew took a slightly different path. Okay, they're going out there on the prairie, and they're heading straight for that, somewhere over there, and all of a sudden they hit an oxbow in the river, and so they turn and they go around that oxbow, and that's the first Mullen Road. But then, uh, the next one wagon that comes, it uses the college student theory, and they cut the corner, because they aren't, they're, gonna, they're gonna walk down the sidewalk, they're gonna cut the corner, and so that's what they do when they're traveling in the wagon. They start cutting the corners. At that time, the federal government owned all the land. There was no patented land in this part of the country. And so they, there was nothing stopping them from going somewhere else, even individuals going somewhere else. So yeah, as subsequent wagons traveled the road, they diverted uh, to long or shorter routes or short routes that appeared to be better than the original. And they're constantly making these things, I think. And, and we don't, it's very difficult to identify whether these are the Mullen Road because all we have for the data to try to find this is the uh, original Mullen maps. They didn't come back and remap all these things. So then in, in 1861 and 62, we have reroutes. 
okay, to where under Mullen's direction to bypass some of the problem areas. Big problem area was the south end of Coeur d'Alene Lake, which the, what my, what's my river? The St. Joe. The St. Joe River in the spring, because of constraints at the lower end of Coeur d'Alene, would rise higher than Helen and wipe out their bridge. And so they turned around in the next years and went around to the north through Cross Plants Ferry over here in the Spokane area, came around through, came over Fourth of July Pass, where they documented, had their Fourth of July celebration in 61. 61, and then they came back and they connected up down in somewhere in the vicinity of the Cal Cataldo Mission. I apologize for this next one, it's a terrible slide because I was using a very small map blowing it up, but the original road came down in through this area and had multiple crossings of the Clark Fork. So they came back the next year and they put in the three mile grade, which some of you went on yesterday with Kim in order to get up out of that wetland in the bottom. Okay. As new communities were established, the road changed to access the commu communities. Um, I'll show one here, okay. Bearmouth was founded in 1866. Everybody know where Bearmouth is out 30 plus miles east of Missoula? Okay. Yeah, come on. The original road went southwest of Bearmoth and went over a little saddle here on a hill and on up this draw, or on up this, this hill here. Well, after the Bearmouth was founded, okay, nobody, you aren't going to bypass Bearmouth when you're on the wagon road. You might pick up some supplies there. There's people there that you can have interchange with. So they went. Instead of coming over this saddle right in here, okay, they went over to Bearmouth and on up, okay, accessing a community. In 1867, the GLO finally came to Montana. They started. They established the National Point down southwest of Three Forks which all of the sectionalized system in Montana is based on. This is where Kim and I first, first started really crossing paths. I uh, asked him, I ran into him in a store. He'd been, I think he'd been around our Mullen days in 2008. I ran into him in a store and says, for Surveyor's Day, you know, for National Surveyor's Day, what could we do for a story? And he thought about it and he'd come back to me, well, let's go to the initial point. So we went down with a colleague of mine, Ron Milam, a uh, photographer from the Missoulian, Kim from the Missoulian. We spent the day going to the initial point and uh, took a picture of this of us sitting on there, acting like surveyors. And this made it to the Missoulian, made it to the National Surveyors uh, his History magazines. Really went a lot of places, but it, it was a pretty, pretty nice event. Okay, that GLO surveys hit Missoula Valley in 1870. And nothing against Suzette, but I was cringing at some of the things she might have been saying about it. But, you know, um, the GLO surveys came through in 1870. They documented as best they could of where the Mullen Road, typically they would only document where it crossed the section lines. They didn't survey the, th the line in between, but they would document where it crossed. And so you got some evidence of where it is. But, uh, so uh, let me back up here. <laughs> Run out of steam, I get going so fast. Uh, so yeah, so it documented where the road was at the time of those surveys. In the Missoula Valley, it was 1870. You're actually in Missoula, the, the township that includes Missoula, okay? As we go further west, where she was talking Frenchtown, that might have been 1870 also, but it starts getting, as you go south, I think it got to Lolo in 70, Corvallis in 72. It progresses as 
as they are trying to get the survey ahead of homesteaders so that they have something to homestead. Okay. Uh, Montana Territorial Enactment in 1869 declared the Mullen or Military Wagon Road a public right of way. What that did, I think prior to that, in one of the first legislatures, they, they, they declared that any, how did they say that? I think it was any uh, existing public road or road that public was traveling on was a public road, okay? But I think they were a little gray on whether the military wagon road, whether they could declare it a public road because it was a road constructed by the federal government across mostly federal property. But I think by 69, there was enough homesteaders starting to come that they wanted to make it a, you know, make it a public road. Also, it gave them the latitude to restrict the people that were going to and finding the constraining spots and putting up toll roads. They would gate, gate off a place that was tight, they would do a little work and they would charge tolls. Well, the territorial legislature stopped them from doing that. You know. We oft times, you know, we oft times think that they operated different than we do now. But, but they operated with different things etc. But conceptually they did the same kind of things. You know, you give somebody a chance to make a buck and they'll sneak in there to make a buck. So they were putting up uh, tolls and they basically, the, the, the territory could give you a license to construct or can prove and establish a road for toll purposes along with ferries. But it would have to come under either the territorial or the, uh, the county government was the only ones that could do that. You couldn't just go out there and set one up without having approval from the governmental that was covering it. Okay, so as the community started to grow, the road was modified to, to, to accommodate the changes in those various communities. Probably takes, you might have seen some up in your country where you could kind of identify that. Um, You've seen some over in the Idaho areas to where you can kind of identify that. But you take a place like Missoula, which I looked at pretty hard, okay, what we've got here, okay, the Mullen Road was plus or minus going right down this pink line. And by what I mean by plus or minus is I can't go in there and say perfect where it is, but I know that it was somewhere between Maine and, and Broadway. Okay, as Missoula Mills was established down here, okay, uh, people coming on the Mullen Road from this direction turned and followed a path down here toward Missoula Mills where they could get supplies. People from this direction, after they crossed the Rattlesnake Creek crossing, they traveled toward the same area where they could get supplies and vice versa when they were leaving. So, Front Street starts, be, what is now Front Street, I guess, starts becoming established as a roadway, okay? These yellow things are where some of the earliest uh, development was taking place along that, uh, along what's now Front Street, okay? So they start to establish this town in here. And, there's, and, and so then by 1875, or actually it'd have to be about 1870, they, realize that they want to have a town site for Missoula and so they there was a process to where you could do a town site of a certain size if you had a certain number of people and you could uh, you could you could take it through the same process as a homestead you could do like a, this one's a 40 acre parcel okay and you could announce that you as this group of people individuals was going was essentially creating a corporation and you were going to have a town site and so they start creating this town site which is was the original Missoula town site okay um, at the same time as that's going on CP Higgins god dang it CP Higgins is up here and he's uh, he's established a homestead on this parcel up 160 acres up here McCormick's 
established a, homes, a, a homestead on this 1870, in 1873. The, he's got 160 acres over here. McCork is down here. Well, they aren't really homesteading that in order to farm it. They homestead in that because they see that the development's coming, the town's going to start to grow, and so they want to have that land to be able to subdivide it once they've proved up on it and have a patent for it. So they go in here and they, they create a roadway that kind of is semi-perpendicular to the Mullen Road. So we've got Higgins, okay? We set out, uh, set out distances so between what's now Front Street, we can put essentially a block, which they, they know about what depth of block is. They put another block up here and then they make this the main road, which is now Broadway. And the Mullen Road gets buried, okay? Did you have a question, Ron? Were you just chasing the beard? Okay. Um, and they probably, you, you can't find this evidence anywhere. You have to just think about it and, and recognize what they probably did. Because all of this at one time was very likely done under some sort of a governmental approval. You just didn't go out and change these things and not tell all your friends and neighbors that you were going to do it. So they would have a process for determining this. And so between the town site people, C.P. Higgins was going to put a subdivision in, W.J. McCormick, they all probably sat and agreed that, okay, this is the way we're going to do it. This area is going to be funny with Front Street and with Main, but that's going to work the best we can make it work and still have Aren't you? My mouse is chasing around. Well, what? It's about time you people told me that, for God's sakes. I'm sitting here watching it on my screen and it's just doing great stuff. God, choo choy duck. Okay, does it do there or anything? Okay, God. Oh boy, there we go. Okay, so we'll go back to here. Okay. This is what ultimately became Front Street, this green line. And what I was talking about is that the, the yellow, this pink line out here is the Mullen Road at that time, okay? So they're coming from the, west, from the east, and they're going to come down here. They're going to cross Rattlesnake Creek right here, and they're going to head for Missoula Mills, okay? They're coming from the other way, okay? and they're following the Mullen Road, and they're going to head for Missoula Mills. Well, they, eventually, this is the, the route that they start developing on. Okay? And then, you know, so we've got, these are some of the earliest businesses that are here. Uh, and so they come up with a system to where they put in West Broadway, which was, I believe, Cedar at that time. So West Broadway is the main street. Okay, and then they put it far enough away from, from front, uh, from front down here, so that they have essentially a full block length from here to here, and a full block length from here to here, and then they do some funny taper and stuff down here, which is all the problems we deal with trying to come in and out of Missoula. It's not because anybody said this would be a good way to do things, it's just stuff happens like that. Now, what do you mean by Missoula Mills for people that don't know? Missoula Mills was the Missoula Mills. Really? It was a wood. It, it was right. It was right about there. It was a uh, sawmill and a grist mill. Whoops, excuse me. There I go with that mouse again. The orange there was was approximately where there was a a grist mill and a sawmill that Higgins and Warden or Warden and Company or something, they, they came to downtown. We'll learn about that tomorrow on the bus. I can't believe I sat there and talked all that time and you're the only one that's brave enough to say, what the heck are you doing? Darn. I guess that must have been it, for God's sakes. Okay. You were what? You know, I have a question that pertains to these Streets. Yes. So in 72, when James Garfield left Bitterroot, he took a stage to Deer Lodge. He describes 
Elgate Canyon, and he says, you can even see stretches of the old London Road in 1872. <coughs> so he thought, so why do you, didn't see that old, it's a decade old. Why did he say that? What were they calling it then in 72? Not in Missoula, but, you know, in the canyon, or, you know, on the way to your lunch. Um, I will go down that rabbit hole sometime and get back to you. That was a, that was a tough one there. Oh God, now you got me trying to use the mouse here. All hell's breaking loose here. Okay, so where am I at now? Huh? Well, I've got this locked into where hopefully it stays the same all the time. <laughs> Plus or minus. So anyhow, so that's what we're dealing with, okay, is there's very significant, you, if, you, if you really follow this, you can go back and see how these, how the Mullen Road got shifted because of how development was coming along, okay? So where's the Red Baron? The what? Where's the Red Baron? I can't remember. I was in Bozeman at that time, wasn't I? I think I was in Bozeman 65 to 70. Wasn't the Red Baron down there then? Yeah, I was in Bozeman most of that time. I'm a bobcat. No, it was a, it was a wild bar, I think. Whoop. Okay, so you have in farmland, okay, road was modified to accommodate farms. Okay, we've got this area that kind of starts to, uh, to encroach on Suzette, Suzette's turf. I'm at the uh, intersection of Mullen Road, titled Mullen Road now, and Reserve Street. Reserve Street's running north-south here. The green line right here is today's Mullen Road. Okay, the original Mullen Road was out here somewhere. And I could find that from the old GLO plats. Well, what I surmise, and I was even, you know, I started going down into this in the last, I think about three o'clock this morning when I was trying to put this all together. <laughs> I started looking and what, and it's interesting is these, what I've done here is I've gone to some of the sources she got, went to, uh, but I'm a little, little better at it because I got 50 years experience and she's got three months. But these are the people that patent these parcels and this is the year they acquired that parcel, acquired that patent. So we've got right here, I've got Matthias Coleman in 1872. Now the survey didn't come till 1870, the GLO, and you've got, you have to be on that patent, you have to be applied for patent and spend five years proving up on it before you can get the patent. So if they didn't survey it until 1870, and they got their patent in 1872, how do they get it? Anybody got an answer? Huh? Graft? No, that's not graft. Not graft, Tom. What they did, I, I, I haven't looked in this area specifically, but what she was talking about when she said the declarations of occupancy, okay, prior to the GOO coming through, the, the, the state legi or territorial legislature had passed an enactment that you could, under the Homestead Act, that you could occupy a 160-acre irregular parcel and start proving up on it under the Homestead Act, even though it wasn't in the sexualized system yet. And so I think what happened is a lot of these people, Coleman, Fisher, Oakley, Coakley, okay, they started proving up on theirs. They, they had a, a uh, declaration of occupancy that was along the Mullen Road, but then when the GLO system came in, they turned around and I don't know whether they're required to or whether they all just agreed to, but they turned around and they ended up with these areas, this 160 acre parcel. Up here in Matthias Coleman, there's 160 acre. Coakley is 160. Anybody get hurt? <laughs> okay. Um, but the interesting thing I found when I started doing this is here we've got Alfred Brown in 1882, and he's, he's only proven up on a 40-acre parcel, okay? 
Mary Green in 1882, an 80-acre. Thomas Marshall, 108, or 1890, 160 acres. Well, all of those are straddling the Mullen Road, and they were the last pieces that were essentially in that area that were homesteaded because that was what was left, and so they went ahead and did that. But then what they did is either the government, or I, I'm not sure how they would have accomplished it, but they ended up, they moved, like in Mary Green's here, instead of having the road go out in the middle of her, or her eight, 48, 80 acres, instead of going out there, they moved it over to here, which is essentially where it is right now, and it was on the high bank above, if you go in that area and you see Walmart down there, okay, you are right at the top of the high bank. So they moved it over there because she couldn't farm down here anyhow, but this gave her access to this, okay. Thomas Marshall over here, okay, they moved it over here going in that way so that he could farm this because this down here was mostly floodplain. Alfred Brown, uh, they couldn't get it far enough away from his, so it still ended up going right down the middle but it was able to connect Mary Green to something on down here. Sir? Now the military road was going through there. Did the military, maybe they did that last because the military road had an easement? It, did, you can't, you can't. it owned all the land. It didn't have to have an easement. Well, I mean, but you couldn't own it, you couldn't homestead within 75 yards. I don't believe so. I don't believe so. I think you could homestead right over top of it because it was not an easement. It was a road created by the military. Well, I mean, but that's why those are last. No, they're last because they, they didn't want to have a homestead with it right, uh, partly because their declarations of occupancy, previous ones, might have been parallel to it and because they couldn't, uh, they were last because they didn't want to homestead. This guy down here, Cornelius, or let's say John Fisher, okay? John Fisher right here, okay? He didn't want to homestead this 80 and this 80 here that Mary Green eventually homesteaded. In fact, this was better land. This was up on top, but he didn't want to homestead that 80 acres because the road was going right through it at the time. So he went down here in the lower land and homesteaded this portion. So, so yeah. there's no legal documentation for easements or anything like that for the... Yes. I don't, I don't, wait, say that again. Well, so if, if you proved up on a claim that had the road going through it, was there, was there legal documentation that if you, you said it wasn't an easement? There, it was a public road. By, by territorial state statute, it was a public road. And so you would have to get approval by the public to move it. Okay. You know, so yeah. I better watch my time. I might have to quit here pretty soon if I don't hurry up. Okay. Uh, what kind of question? Some of that stuff, you got it back. Yeah, if you had ore there that you could claim that you had ore that you could patent, but you really couldn't patent a prairie. Yeah, I think that was Yeah. It's because that's when they, they, they started coming into the valley in 1866, 67, and started proving up on these declar declarations of occupancy. It's adjacent to a large piece of ground that's being mined right now. Not for anything that was, not for anything important during that time period. Okay, I'm going to rush through some stuff. I don't have. I'm my own timekeeper, so I can just keep running and cut into Ken's time down here. Oh well, yeah, five. Tom says five. Okay, there was things like in 1883. They, the the road kind of went down where the uh, Pacific Railroad went, coming through the east side of Missoula. So they moved it over and put it the road to the south of the railroad, where. It, plus or minus where the highway is right now, the old highway, not the interstate. You run into things like 
in Clinton here where they patented it and they probably overlapped the Mullen Road so they turn around and they call the piece that's in the railroad right away because it's here's the railroad right away right here but they call this piece the Mullen Avenue and I'm sure there's some people today that think that's the Mullen Road okay they had things like down in the the point of rocks to where they cut through the uh, or where the Milwaukee rerouted it the upper left there is Mullen's map one, one of our one of their sketch maps the rest of it is my attempt to show where it is and so when we look right down this is getting difficult when we look right down here okay the Milwaukee we start to get down where we're encroaching Milwaukee so they turn around and they put it up through here we're encroaching the Milwaukee down in here so they've moved the rare moved it up sir so the Milwaukee then just said They were right here, and the old Milwaukee the Road went here, and they said, "Now nah, we kind of want this. Why don't we just push you up here?" Well, and they they pro you makes sense. Guy told me sometime the record is everywhere. There's always a record for all this stuff. It's just you can't find it most of the time, unless you go to Tom Minkler's archives. He's got something somewhere that might prove it to you. Uh, well, the railroad can do it because they have basically. Well, but what, what they had that was the best in this situation that you're talking about is they had money to make it a more easily traveled road. You know, because it was much easier to travel where it is now, what we see now, than it was original. And they, and they had all that black powder that they could push those things through. I mean, one of those rock cuts is, is 15 foot deep. Okay, when the car started coming out, they started creating routes that accommodate car traffic. Over Cam Camel's Hump, you can see the track of the original Mullen Road going over Camel's Hump. You know, everybody know where Camel's Hump is? No. Plus or minus? Just west of St. Regis. It's, nor it's north of the interstate. There's a drainage up there that it comes out of. So the, the red line here is where Camel's Hump was, and the other line is where the road goes now. Now one thing if you look, you can recognize is look at the extra length that it took to get to the top of that to make something a car went on as opposed to what they had on the wagon. You got another 50% of the distance to get up there. So it, yes, yeah, the one on the right is the old highway, or is, is the Camel's Hump Highway. This question came up so much the other day I thought I'd throw this in here. I went to the Yellowstone Trails website this morning Everybody had asked about this Yellowstone Trail thing. They were, they were, everybody seemed to be asking like they thought it was a constructed road to be the Oregon or the Yellowstone Trail. The reality is, was, I'll read this, in 18, 1912, a group of small town businessmen in North South Dakota undertook an ambitious project to create a useful automobile route, the Yellowstone Trail across America. This was at a time when roads weren't marked, Few maps, slippery mud was the usual road surface. The Trail Association located a route, motivated road improvements, produced maps and folders to guide the travelers, and promoted tourism along its length. It became a leader in stimulating tourist travel to the northwest west, and motivating good roads across Monta America. So it wasn't a road created, it was a road connected and named. I should have Suzette show for this one because this has, I kind of threw this together is that, uh, you know, this is out towards Stone Container out west of Missoula, almost a French town. Um, the pink line is today's asphalt. They are very straight, long stretches, and Mullen very likely did not have that. That came around when they started putting asphalt in, or initially roads roads with uh, borrow pits and all of that in order to make it straighter and more easily accessible by cars. And so in that, in that particular area, it's very unlikely that more than a few spots that that is following the original Mullen Road. But today, that's all Mullen Road to everybody. In fact, I, I, one of these days when Suzette gets a little more 
versed in what she's talking, we'll go talk about what she, whether she lived on the Mullen Road or whether she lived in the vicinity of where the Mullen Road used to be. So the conclusion I had here was that there are a few places where the center line of any current traveled way coincides with the center line of the Mullen or Military Road when it was designated as a 66-foot right-of-way in 1869. Now I put that, I left that in here. I did this PowerPoint originally because the county surveyor's office, they were, they were in a fight with an engineering company because the engineering company was going to vacate a 60-foot right-of-way and they thought Peter Dayton, who just passed away last week, attorney that specialized in roads, he said that, uh, or they convinced him, or he, he had said in a talk that the Mullen Road was dedicated to 66 feet. Well, for God knows how many years, surveyors had gone out, surveyed along the asphalt going west of Missoula, called the Mullen Road, and they had surveyed 30 feet each side of center line, and that's usually where the fences were, and that's where they put their monuments, and the assistant county attorney came out and said, it's 66 feet. With, that was his opinion, and he was going to have them force all of that stuff to be resurveyed, three feet added outside the fence, et cetera, et cetera. So the county surveyor's office thought that they would go, you know, they would school me, and put me up against him in a debate. Well, we did following uh, presentations right behind each other, and he gave his on his opinion and why he did his opinion. I gave mine, and my final words were this thing right here, and I basically told him, you can, put the, you can call that road whatever you want, but I can fight you on every time that any piece of asphalt out there is not the 66-foot Mullen Road route. <laughs> and so, and within a couple of weeks after I did that, he rescinded his opinion. So it was pretty cool. Anyhow, I better shut up. Uh, you got some questions intermittently. I'm running, oh no, I've still got three minutes, four minutes. If you got another question? Or no, we're on break now, aren't we? We should be on break. Bill. <laughs> I don't know, most of the, a large percentage of those were on the St. Regis River, and I've, I don't know what they did. You know, I think when they built those, they were used to the, uh, possibly used to the spring runoffs in their areas in the east, and they didn't realize that the, in, the, in the west, coming out of those mountains, what they were going to have, and it took all those bridges out, and I don't know what they did. Do you, you know? Have you heard anything? Um, they, would, they would be corduroy decks, yes, but they would have log structure framing. Anything else? If I could pause a moment, I want to cherish this moment for, for a couple more seconds. I've stuck Bill White, and I'm going to have that go to the... <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to give it up. Uh, Just we kind of swing right into Ken. Oh, go. Yeah. yeah, let's just go right into Ken. Uh, it, I ran too long. I got carried away. Let's let's power through here. Maybe maybe take a two or three minute break while Ken gets set up.